Oh my goodness. Bad touching, harassment, sex, violence, fraud, threats. All things that could have been avoided if you had Fama. Stop hiring dangerous people. Fama.io You know what I like about iSolved? Everything. iSolved is people-centric. And in a people-centric world, you need a people-centric solution. iSolve People Cloud is a comprehensive human capital management solution that helps you employ, enable, and empower your workforce throughout the entire employment lifecycle. From tracking to recruiting to onboarding and compliance, from payroll to benefits to time and labor management, transform your employee experience for a better today and a better tomorrow with iSolved. For more information, go to iSolvedHCM.com. Hey, sweet Tin Cup and Ryan Leary. You are listening to the You Should Know podcast. Everyone's laughing, which I love. <laughs> got Kyle on from Indeed. We're going to be talking about the great disconnect. So, we've already started laughing. We got to laugh it out of the way. It's time well, we're, la- we're, we're laughing at you. I, we're I laughing like with you. I should say with you. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely, definitely let this laugh. No, no, definitely at. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I got big shoulders. Kyle, would you do us a favor and uh, introduce yourself and what you do at Indeed? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, good to be here. Love you guys. Uh, I'm a talent strategy advisor at Indeed. And, uh, what that means is uh, essentially I do a lot of what you guys do. And I just don't have a podcast to talk about it. I do a lot of research on the labor market and I understand all the tech that's out there. And um, I get to help employers kind of skate to where the puck is going and, and understand the generations of today and hopefully get them to evolve their practices and strategies to hire some good folks. Do you ever do you ever read other people's research, like uh, like another vendor? Uh, you know, do you read any of their reports? All the time, Gartner, LinkedIn, everybody. Yeah. 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 So you're a cons- you're a consumer of research as well. Oh, Jeez. very much so. Yeah, that's that's nice. all I do: podcasts and research. It feels like. Oh, that's fantastic. Isn't that yeah, a yeah. great job to have? Like that's, that's just a, a great career. Job. What it are does, you doing but... today? Well, I'm reading and talking. Yeah. But then you're at like a family reunion and that's all you can talk about. And I was like, okay, well, maybe don't go hang out yeah. with Uncle Kyle. That all he wants to do is talk about the labor market. <laughs> He's cool to take a, talk about unemployment and some other stuff and experience. Jobs, and Jobs not being created in so, certain <laughs> vend, uh, certain industries. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to play that basketball now. Yeah. Um, so... But wait, Chris, if it's slowing. Uh, sorry. <laughs> No, but this is really interesting. So it went from 3.8 to 3.9, back to 3.8. But here's what people don't talk about. Yeah. You just yeah. see everyone check yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, it's when he, it, but part. it's when Kyle breaks out the, hey, Johnny, look, don't do this in school. Don't go to law school. We're going to go into humanities. We're going to talk about history. So, dude, we need trade, emotional intelligence. <laughs> yeah. Just take uh, me fishing. Just study empathy. You know, that that actually brings up a really interesting uh, point, Ryan. There for a while, you would tell people to go into STEM. Yes. That was the advice for a lot of younger people. It's just do STEM. You'll be fine. Yeah. You'll, you know, it'll all work out. Just do something in STEM. With AI and generative AI, I, I don't know if that's the best advice. You know, I don't know. If it'll, it'll shake out in time, but I just don't know if, mm-hmm. if you tell people the same thing. So, anyhow, Kyle. Would you do us a favor and talk – take take us into the idea or the construct of the great disconnect? Yeah, it's um, it's something that I think a lot of people are already familiar with. There's Now there's just a title to it, right. and it's that there's just a big difference between what employers believe um, make up a good workplace and what job seekers believe make up a good workplace. And um, there's a big disconnect, a great there's one. A big- some great say. <laughs> the expectations so, versus reality. Right. Well, the expectations are different, period. Just those two vantage points. So before there might have been a similar shared expectations, if you would. Mm-hmm. Now the expectations are different. Like I can't remember when we did the podcast, but one of them was Gen Z won't even won't apply to a job if they don't have the salary in it. Mm-hmm. Whether or not there's state law or not doesn't matter or federal or whatever whether or not there was law it was it's the expectation so the expectation for the recruiter was like hey we're not we're not mandated 
we don't have to put it in there because it's a it's a return to office position or it's an office position so it's inside this place that doesn't have you don't have to you're not you don't have to disclose your requirements and gen z two out of three not respond not responding not applying Sorry, but so that that's just, the three folks now really three fourths are more likely to apply if they see salary but, salary, but if they don't they consider it a red flag and so they just they won't that's that's why we um we don't consider pay transparency to be a trend anymore. We we call okay, it a yeah. standard, it's uh, a necessity because it's such a big deal breaker for folks. Yeah. yeah. So what other missed expectations? Again, from both sides, from employers, if you have that, and uh, from candidates. Well, let's go through some of those, if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, you already touched on one: it's pay transparency. The other one is uh, like lack of flexibility in work. There's a lot of return to office mandates. Uh, coming from a, a bunch of different companies and people are not very happy. There's also uh, <laughs> a disaster of candidate experiences all over the place that just, they take way too long and, and they ask far too much of uh, job seekers. Like a lot of job seekers are um, kind of forced to spend a full hour to fill out just an application right. and, and do an assessment and like have a question on paid labor. Let me ask, let me ask. So let's go through these as you go through them. So you're in Austin. Mm -hmm. Indeed has an office, a beautiful office in Austin. I agree. If if it was, and it won't be, but if it was mandated that you needed to go back five, six days a week, whatever the bit is, I'm not asking if you you would quit or to get another job. I'm asking be careful you, how you answer. Yeah. <laughs> would it change your outlook? On oh, 100%. Your, yeah. Yeah, right? Because yeah, I, I got this job um, during the pandemic, so it was 2021, and I was – Fully remote position uh, from right. the get go, and I do travel a little bit, but right. um, yeah, you know, I get to hang out at home with my dog. Uh, my wife, she actually also uh, probably a, a better story. She was hired as a remote um, employee, and her office did ask them to come back three days a week, and then coming up here shortly, they want them to go back five days a week. So she put in her notice. Yeah. Uh, she's just like nice. it just takes work for her. Not and, good that. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, it's it's a big deal because I mean, cars are expensive, right? Commutes aren't fun. Yeah, oh, yeah. And a lot of times, the folks who invite you to the office, there's nothing different between the office and your home, other than yeah. you're less comfortable and you have to be a little bit more extroverted, possibly. Uh, but mm. they don't really give you the time to really connect with the. Yeah, you... that's the lie. Oh well, that's one of the. I, I, I don't. I want to say this explicit lie. I think they really believe it. Some of the people that are championing RTO, they believe soft skills can be developed or developed more fully in an office environment. Let's jump in here. Let's do a design shred. Let's brainstorm. Let's get to meet each other in sales. Let's go do a bunch of objection response stuff together and see each other. You can't. You can do it on Zoom or whatever, but it's just not as intense. It's just not as good. And then you end up at the office and you don't do that. Yeah. And so it's like, mm -hmm. you're, you, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. no, I what's going to happen is you go to the office, you can't get your system to connect the yeah. guy for, from IT is at home working remotely. So you've got to check, track that person down. It's a mess. Yeah. Cool. Why, why can't Kyle, why, I don't know if you're, if you're seeing this or having this conversation with others, but why, couldn't why can't organizations just survive with a hybrid model why are they fighting this um real estate cost real estate that that seems to be the answer <laughs> for, for most so of they've the already got it yeah most no, of no, yeah they've spoken to go ahead go. Oh, i was just gonna say and most of the companies i've spoken to like their yeah. hr leaders chros they, they all say that it's because they own some buildings <laughs> and they have, or they have seven year leases um, and they have to use that. It's an asset of theirs. And uh, so they could get out of it during the pandemic. They could get out of it and they could get out of a lot of those lease payments because of force majeure. Uh, it's out of their hands. It's God's will or, or et cetera. Uh, once that ended, they had to pay those leases. Right. So there's this lens in large what happened if you signed 2019. You sign a seven-year lease. Then all of a sudden, you go through COVID. Those years, they didn't pay. Right. The problem is they also extended the contract. So right. It got tacked paying, on. Right. It got tacked on. Right. But what's the difference, though? I mean, you're going to pay for it regardless. So why it's not? Second, second business outside of talent. 
Talent's always the largest expense in a business. Second and if you're going to lose that talent from estate. forcing them in the office, why not just? <laughs> All good questions, right? Ryan. All yeah, good questions. right. All good questions. Right. All I'm not letting questions. my thought go here. I'm going to win. No, no. If, if CFO, <laughs> I think I really believe that the CFOs could get out of those leases because it's not just the lease of the space. It's all that stuff inside of it. Well, yeah. And air sure. conditioning, electric, all this stuff that's there. And indeed, in a great example, they have a fantastic space, fantastic building. Cafeteria, dude, you want for nothing. You go inside that thing, and it's just like, shit, I, I want fettuccine alfredo. And, you know, it's done. They'll make it. Like, it is intense. So they've got all of that stuff. So, I mean, you can kind of see it, but if they could get out of that cost, like if, if the commercial sure. brokers would let them out of that cost, we wouldn't be having this discussion around flexibility. Yeah, I, I definitely think that real estate's the the biggest, like one of the biggest reasons why one folks the choose that. Mm-hmm. The other one is that a lot of folks that are in leadership belong to a certain generation 100%. who are not familiar with how to build relationships online, whereas the younger generations are very familiar with how to build relationships online. So it's they're speaking two different languages when it's like, well, we can have community over Zoom if we wanted to, and right. the leaders don't know what that looks like, you know, because they they didn't grow up in that world, and so that part of that disconnect. Um, it's, it's almost the opposite. Two different groups because before. if you go to Boomers and Gen Z, so let's do the the farthest we can. Boomers don't know how to build a relationship online. Gen Z has the opposite problem. They have <laughs> difficulty building relationships mm. offline. Sure. That's the difficulty for them. So you can kind of see those two. And like millennials and Gen uh, X are in the middle of that. They've got some of them that cross over. But, yeah, I can see that being a disconnect. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. No, you covered it. That was my question. (laughs) Fair enough. All right. So you went after you went through the disconnect of, okay, hybrid or flexibility, as as you called it. So the first thing is trans or one of the first things was transparency. Then, then, uh, I want to take a break real quick just to let you know about a new show we've just added to the network. Up Next at Work, hosted by Gene and Kate Akeel of the Devon Group. Fantastic show. If you're looking for something that pushes the norm, pushes the boundaries, has some really spirited conversations, Google Up Next at Work, Gene and Kate Akeel from the Devon Group. Flexibility. Flexibility. What's the next one? Because you were getting uh, into them, you're listing them off. And I'm yeah, like, oh. The candidate experiences, what it's like to apply to a job, and what it's like to even just go through the interview process. It's a like an Indiana Jones adventure. Sometimes you gotta, you know, you gotta swap the uh, medallion. You gotta run down the thing. You gotta dodge <laughs> darts. Or one of those darts. Yeah, darts are going past you. Um, there's a big company that I worked with. You've heard of them. And I was showing them through their candidate experience and how bad it was. It took me 52 minutes to get through an entry level position application because they had, they had two different assessments that I had to take um, to determine whether or not I was qualified for an entry level position. And obviously, they're checking the candidates for like personality and culture ad and, all, and those types of things. But if you're thinking about it from the job seekers perspective, which is something it's that entry level. Yeah, it's entry level and and yeah. um they have very little time to apply to many roles and they're trying to apply to dozens of jobs in one sitting and one What's company that? taking up a full hour of their time, it seems never a bit disrespectful. Yeah. How many how many TikTok videos is that? Let's see. Let's do the math. No. <laughs> Sixty. So, <laughs> he's done the math. <laughs> and if they're thirty seconds, it's one hundred and twenty. Yeah, yeah, there's no way. That oh, uh, God. changes my entire day. Was that mobile friendly? Do you remember if that experience? Was? Oh no, that one was not mobile friendly. So that yeah, added added injury from there. Oh, my God. Yeah. And so that's like, that's a big piece is that when employers are thinking about the job seeker experience, they get it. They're like, yeah, of course we don't want to put too many barriers in front of someone because high quality candidates aren't going to spend a full hour filling out an application. They've got too many things to do. Um, But it takes a special person at the employer to raise that flag until that flag is raised. They're just continuing on with pre COVID traditions. What worked before. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think mm-hmm. I think it's also that generation is what at least I, I, I feel like if you want to go after Gen Z and you want to heavily recruit Gen Z, you need people in Gen Z de- designing the process and also meeting them at the gate. Yeah. And that way they, they see somebody that they know or they see somebody that's like them. They can answer questions, but they also they understand that process better. You know, they can explain, you know, why they did certain mm-hmm. things. Have you read or seen anything about uh, candidates expecting, if I'm, you're going to ask me for something, not only tell me, but tell me why and give me something. So I'll give you an example. In the background screening world, what some of the players have done is, yes, the background, uh, the background check is for the uh, employer check. But what they do is they flip it and they also give a copy of the background check to the applicant. Mm-hmm. And so they basically say, hey, listen, have you ever wondered like what these reports are like? You know, is it, do we have your permission to do a background check? And you'll get a copy. Well, then it's like you check that off like, oh, okay, cool. I'll do, yeah, I'd like to see what's on that report. Mm-hmm. So like, I think that people don't do that with like assessments. Like a personality assessment isn't a big deal it's a big deal because the person doesn't know when they're getting for that investment, that time. Well, you, it's also, it's, it's also, even if they were to get it back, they don't necessarily know what the company is looking for. Right. Cause it, it'll put you in a bucket of some sort, you know, whether it's Meyer Briggs or a uh, disc or any, any of right. these paradox has some, so it'll put you in a bucket. So you'll, you'll be like, Oh, I'm in bucket a. Did I get what that mean? <laughs> <laughs> bucket A was the rejections. Got right. it. Right. Well, thank you. What could make it? Well, it could make. I'm trying to make it work. What could make that work is if they told you what that position usually is. Yeah, I think that would be really nice. Or the um, cultural overlay for the company, or something like that. But then you might be like introducing some bias into how someone fills out an assessment. Right. I, at least speaking from my own personal uh, experiences, right. right. that. If I know that they're looking for ducks and I'm very much a chicken, I'm going to fill out the assessment as if I'm a duck. You're going to quack. I need a job. I'm going to quack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair. Um, So that's a, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough boat to put people in and expect them to row the entire way. Yeah. The, the other, you were, so William, you were, you were talking about, you need Gen X in. The, the position to hire in yeah. the process, right? Yeah. Doesn't that introduce, and Kyle, you, you know, I'll ask you, doesn't that introduce potential ageism into the mix as well or bias there? You're pulling, you're specifically putting someone of a generation in a position to create a process to hire people of a position and exclude other people. Although I fully agree with everything yeah. we're saying. Oh my goodness. Bad touching, harassment, sex, violence, fraud, threats, all things that could have been avoided if you had FAMA. Stop hiring dangerous people. FAMA.io. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. There's definitely some risk there. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that like you necessarily need a Gen Z or a millennial in order to think like a Gen Zer or a millennial. Really, you just need some empathy. You just need to understand what someone is going through and what the climate looks like, which there's right. plenty of information um, out there to, to give someone that, that uh, mindset. But that's really all we need is more emotionally intelligent leaders to consider the experience of those who they're trying to attract. And... Oh, right. That to your point earlier, we used to think of candidates, uh, and I think there's still a lot of leaders that think of candidates as a faucet. You turn on the faucet, candidates come. And so if you want to put them through a 30-minute interview process or, or application process, really what you're mm-hmm. talking about, or 50-minute or 10-minute, does it, we dictate. Yeah. And the thing is, is the, cha- the talent has changed to such a degree to where you don't dictate. Even in even in a shortage where there's scarcity of talent, you, you don't dictate. Still, and no. that's that's the emotional intelligence and empathy that you're talking about. You got to care about what they're going through and how they go through this experience. And if you do that, you, you have a decent chance of getting them. Yeah. If you don't, you don't. Yeah. Well, then you introduce also speed, 
velocity, right? On yeah. the, the the dynamics of the actual job market itself. So companies lower their standards all the time to move faster. Now you're introducing non-quality candidates accepting right. volume to get to what you hope is quality. All right. I want to talk to you for a moment about retaining and developing your workforce. It's hard. Recruiting is hard. Retaining top employees is hard. Then you've got onboarding, payroll, benefits, time in labor management. You need to take care of your workforce and you can only do this successfully if you commit to transforming your employee experience. This is where ISOF comes in. They empower you to be successful. We've seen it with a number of companies that we've worked with and this is why we partner with them here at WorkDefined. We trust them and you should too. Check them out at isolvedhcm.com. One of the things that we uh, advise companies on is you can move fast and still get good quality as long as you are transparent and authentic in like job ads or with your employer brand, as long as you're, as long as you're genuine. genuine. I, that's the thing that I think is uh, the biggest learning opportunity for folks is that especially the younger generations that grew up with the mm -hmm. internet. Um, this, I think this is the case for most folks who are uh, somewhat media literate is that they can kind of see through the corporate BS and, and yeah. job ads. And yeah, um, yeah. yeah if, if they're not being authentic, if they're not talking about the good, the bad and the ugly, then yeah. it will be more difficult for them to attract folks. Right. So Kyle, yesterday, I forget what prompted this what our exercise we were doing we started looking at craigslist it was another episode we were recording something and craigslist came up somehow and so i went on the craigslist I'm like how is craigslist still here like what's well, I, the deal? i didn't believe it still existed well i know it existed i just couldn't believe that it's actually still a Uses major a yeah. 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 So I went into all the jobs and I'm looking at all the local jobs of companies that I know that are within five minutes of my home. And I went to their Indeed postings. I went to their LinkedIn postings. To I went to the these other posting. to find the same post. They don't exist. And so no. they'll have a posting on Indeed or LinkedIn or somewhere else. And it's like a posting. I mean, it's yeah. the biggest BS like you'll find. Sure. Craigslist. Legit, I have to send you some of these things. They were four or five lines. If you like this, you will do well here. We pay this. If you don't like this, no need to apply. So, like, so the my our favorite one, Kyle, you'll uh, <laughs> North Philly. Oh. <laughs> North Philly securities God. on premise will have you out by three. Like, <laughs> no, it didn't, no, it didn't say by three. It said you. Daylight. It said yes, comma you will be out before nighttime. <laughs> because it's not in such a secure area. And I'm yeah. like, that is genius. That's what, that, they, now, led that's what they led with. Security that is communication. Is on premise. You'll be out with yeah. daylight. They're not okay. hiding the fact it's not a secure place. <laughs> Everybody knows it. Like you don't right. go there and live there right. if you don't. You know this. And right. that was their opening line. Yes, you will. Yes, there is security on premise. Yes, comma, you will be out before evening but or to, something to like Kyle's that. Kyle's point. It's authentic. That's authentic. Yes. Yeah. That's not getting into the capabilities and you know what we're looking at in a job and what you're going to get at, at the business. That's none of that stuff. It's like, yeah. what, is the, what are the two fears that they have? Yeah. In North Philly, in this particular region for that particular job, it's like, listen, are you worried about how long it's going to take the police to get to a certain place? You don't have to worry about that. We have right. security on premise. Two, yeah. you're not have to go to have, you're not going to have to go out in the dark. There was no and disconnect so, there. Yeah, there <laughs> they, Okay. They well, answered the questions up front. I don't know if they even got to any of the other stuff. <laughs> no, they, well, it had it had the pay rate and it had yeah. the hours. Yeah. And what was the other one? Said oh, it said prepare. It said uh, it said here for our plan to plan to be here for up to four hours for a trial shift yeah. and to start the next day or something like that. Oh. I was like, super that is fantastic, genius. That's all, that's all we're asking for. Is just some options. That's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. In that particular, yeah. and, and people, there are a bunch of people on Indeed that do this right. I mean, you got a great because of so much yeah. data that you're sitting on, so many jobs that you're sitting on. You got some people that do it right. And so the cool thing is, is you can point to them and say, listen, don't cut and copy this. Don't do that because you've got a unique DNA. You've got unique things that make you okay. Mm -hmm. But look at, look at this job. And it says, hey, we have a roller skating rink. 
we have this, we have that, but we're going to work 100 hours a week. It's one of these, it's a shark infested waters. Okay, but you're going to work. Work is your life. Your life is your work, et cetera. We're not going to say we're a family. We're not a family. It's work. Yep. Now, if you read that, Ed, and that's not you, you just go to the next thing. Yeah. So no, that, that's where no you harm, get no harm. harm. No harm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You've added no noise to the recruiters uh, as well because you're just not going to apply. It's like, even if I get that job, I don't want that job. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, Kyle, where where does tech and process come into this? Where does where does tech play a role? Yeah. Great. Uh, for the candidate experience piece. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually just did a webinar around like AI uh, in the hiring process. The I think the big thing that's going to really possibly surprise people is that it's going to take care of the searching piece for a lot of recruiters. It's already good, and for job seekers, like we already have a pretty good algorithm to help folks find a relevant job. But for employers, like we're we're going to take out all of the searching, so they can focus more on the human connection and that uh, and telling an authentic story. So I, I think like technology is going to go in that direction, is like getting rid of like, all the operational duties that right. recruiters are currently doing, including writing job ads uh, to a degree. And allow them to just focus on the human human connection, which is probably the most important piece about human resources is the mm -hmm. human part, human, right? the H. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it'll I think it'll help uh employers really quickly identify like, oh, this talent seems like it would be good for you because they prefer these things and that falls in line with what you expect from your culture and right. So. Do you have a do you have a personal take on recruiters being a, a candidate advocate or uh, an employer advocate? Ooh, good question. <laughs> yeah, I, I've listened to lots of podcasts that say they have to be fifty fifty. Let's I'm for a moment. Yeah. I'm of I'm of the belief that they should be candidate focused. I might be a little bit biased. I'm working for a company whose mission it is to help people get jobs, not help people find workers. Um, right. But yeah, like the the candidates, I think that's the soul of the business. That's the people of it. So if you're not yeah. solely focused on the uh, inbound talent that's coming through those doors um, and making sure that they are placed in a good team and that they understand what the culture is like, then you're just setting everybody up for failure for the future. Yeah. What else? What's your What's your job right. at that point? In fact, I, I think the recruiters that say this is it for you. Or this hiring manager is Much not better. for you. You're a great fit, but just not for this job. And they don't mean it in that way. They mean yeah. it like that team, that boss, that 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 circumstance is not going to be good for you. You're not going to win. It's an untenable, yeah. unwinnable game. Did you have some, before we went into that? Did you have some more disconnects? Just one more. All right. What do you got? And it's something that we've kind of already been talking about. It's just that like the reputation precedes an employer by experience. So. Um, job seekers talk and especially Gen Z folks, but like a lot of job seekers tell their friends, don't, it, don't apply to Acme brick. Uh, that's a real company. Uh, don't, don't apply to company A because they put me through the ringer for six weeks and then ghosted me. Uh, and, uh, they take note of some of that really bad, you know, what some would call toxic behavior and. They tell all of their friends and none of their friends will apply. And so this uh, has a big trickle down effect in terms of like how you treat candidates. So that's another big disconnect. I don't know if employers really realize that they do have reputations and they right. should focus a lot on their employer brand and being as authentic as they can. So that way there are no surprises. And ratings are a two-way street. Like Van, my, my youngest son was asking me about this yesterday. He's like, can you cancel a ride in the middle of a ride. Mm. I'm like, no, once they pick you up, you've already, you've <laughs> sussed that out. First of all, they have your bank account information, yeah. but you've already sussed that out. Cause he was fascinated with, with, uh, basically, okay, they've accepted your ride. So the driver has accepted you, you've accepted them. Okay. So there's a mutual, they're around the block. They pick you up. Once they've picked you up, we're agreed. They're going to take you to a place. Yeah. However, They've got ratings. If you act, if you act in a terrible way in the car, right. they've got ratings for you. And if they act terrible in the car, you've got ratings for them. So there's a mechanism there. 
And I can see can the cans have been doing with your sister company, Glassdoor. The cans have and employees have always had a way to kind of talk about like their experience, which is great. <laughs> yeah. I I wanna I wanna get to a point where recruiters have ratings. I know that recruiters are gonna hate this, by the way. <laughs> However, I'm sure they will. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure they're gonna hate it. However, and hiring managers too. If my if I had my druthers, it would be both. It'd be everyone if you touch talent and in, in the in the candidate experience. You have ratings. Well, they so do we that can... for CEOs and executives, right? Why couldn't we do that for recruiters and hiring right. managers? Yeah. But, dude, now I know that I'm dealing with a 1.2 instead of a five-star. Mm -hmm. Like, if I know if I'm dealing with a 1.5, first of all, why are they still there if they're right. a 1.2, right? Because sure. yeah. it, it would, it would, it would, it would, again, people are going to, bad people are going to act bad yeah. no matter what you do. You're always going to Do you want to go to the Luxor or the win? <laughs> Your choice. Like you have the option. Kyle, are you see, are you seeing a difference between larger enterprise mega corporations and the local companies yeah. in in um, in the uh, disconnect in terms of you, the example you gave? For example, friends will give you bad reviews, or friends will not refer other friends to apply if you treat them poorly. So a local mom and pop said dry cleaners or a restaurant or, you know, a supermarket that's local as opposed to a Nike store. Are you seeing a difference there? Um, well, there's short answer is no, because the smaller, the smaller the store, store, they can of course turn on a dime. So if they needed to shift how they do things and how they operate, it's much easier for them to do so. But they don't have as much access to information that some of the larger companies might. Mm -hmm. So these larger companies might have more data in terms of what works and doesn't work for them um, because they, of course, have larger volumes. But it's much harder for them to turn that large monster uh, mm -hmm. to, to shift their uh, practices, right? So, yeah, I, I, in terms of like how they manage talent, um, I see the same common misconceptions, no matter what the size of the company it could be a small franchise right. versus it could be a, a gigantic global corporation. And they both say the exact same thing 100%. Uh, where it's like, we don't understand what's going on or we don't understand how fast we can like, or, or, or how quickly we can make these changes. Got it. It's like that old thing. Friends don't let friends drink and drive. Friends don't let friends apply to company X. Um, I think, I think the thing for me is the authenticity is the hardest for me. I think it's the hardest algebra to solve for these companies is because they have either, they have a really terrible culture and they know it, or they're in the, they're in the mid, they're in the midst of changing their culture. And so their culture is aspirational. It's not what they are now. It's what they would like to be. And then they have a hard time telling that story. Um, and in the case of it being a terrible culture, they have a hard time telling that story because they want to tell a story over here that's magical. And then, you know, everyone has a happy ending and in this story over here. And the truth isn't that way. So then you recruit the people based on being on inauthentic. They get in, they stay for a little while, they earn a paycheck or two. Maybe they stay a while longer and they're, they're really looking to leave because you lied to them. This has all been based on a lie. So, Kyle, how do you teach people to be authentic? Uh, uh, it's really teaching folks how to listen than it is how to be authentic. Okay. Um, because m most of the companies that I've worked with, they don't know what their culture is. Like, if you were to ask them, like, how would you describe your culture as if it were a personality? How would you describe it? And right. you just start looking at each other because they don't really know. And I don't think it's ever been defined for them in, in a lot of cases. Uh, or if it has been defined, there's there's a very small overlap of Venn diagram. Those who have right. a, it's not defined and those who are acting on a, a set of values or a mission statement. And there's a very small sliver of companies that do both, uh, right. that know it and act on it all the time. And those are usually the companies that are considered cult brands, right? The the, the ones that engender so much loyalty from their customers as well as their employees. Right. It's to get to the point of understanding what the culture is, like they just have to listen to their employees. And and most companies that I've talked to, they 
only pull on one lever to really understand how their folks feel and they do engagement surveys right. um, or pulse surveys. And I don't know, the big issue with those uh, is that uh, folks never believe that they're fully anonymous. So, um, true. so they're not going to be uh, truthful in, in terms of uh, uh, being critical about who they work for and where they work and the friction between them and their best work. So all of these internal surveys that folks are like living and breathing, they're always more positive than they actually. 100%. Love my boss. Reality. Yeah. Love yeah. the team. Yeah. CEO's vision's amazing. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Checks off. That's why I, I like the, well, you can't do this unless you're in the office, really anonymous, unless they have cameras watching it. But the little bathroom sensors, right? The, the, the green face, the red, right? You just yeah. tap the button and you move on. I yeah. love those things. Like I, I tap them all the time. Yeah. And then I get yelled at because I touched a dirty thing. From Dude, my I, I'm so head. terrible with those things, especially at airports where I'll just keep pushing buttons. <laughs> I'll just stand in front of it and push all the buttons. Cause I feel like yeah. there's a yeah. lot of people that pop. Like a lot of but if I have to do that at home or if I have to do that somewhere, they're going to track me. Like I feel yeah, like yeah. they're going to track me. Yeah. Like, I'm, yeah. Yeah. So like, well, we would, we advise employers to, uh, pull on more than one lever to understand how they're folks mm -hmm. are doing, it. and then give them like a an actual safe environment to speak their mind. And the companies that do this the best are doing state, state interviews. interviews. Yeah. Um, and they're and the state interviews are always conducted by someone that is not in the chain of command of the person being interviewed. Right. So it's never right. someone's manager or manager's manager. Yeah. Why are you here? Why? Yeah. Why? Why is this interesting to you? Yeah. yeah. You just say like, "What do you need to stay here for another year?" And you just let them talk. Um, and they will tell you everything that they need in order to stay for having, yeah. and that's, yeah. I, those are some of the more authentic ways to understand and listen to the culture and, and see what folks need. Um, and then obviously like external reviews is, is another lever that folks pull on, but they don't necessarily think that any of those are truthful. It's like, well, if someone's super critical about you externally, um, right. And that means that they don't feel like they have a place internally to actually share these feelings. So I wouldn't necessarily think that they're lying, but rather they're finally getting something off of their chest. So we should be listening to them with the same intensity that we listen to engagement surveys. Yeah. So do you, I, I, and again, this is all kind of a, a work in progress. Where is culture derived? Is it because a lot of people put it in HR, mm -hmm. or they put it at the C-suite. Sometimes they put it. The examples was, uh, was famously, they put it at the office, uh, the receptionist, mm -hmm. and they put it at the employee level that, that, that basically culture comes from. So you've got come from the top, come from the bottom, or come from somebody, uh, a culture czar in HR. What's your, what, you know, what's your working thesis right now? Where does culture come from? So the, what I'm about to say comes from, I spent a lot of time, I worked at Apple for uh, five yeah. years. And then I went and I studied companies like Ritz Carlton and Starbucks and Disney. And so what I found was that culture really comes from the people, right? And each department is going to be slightly different in, in um, right. how they act, but that's essentially what the culture is. But from the top down, those are like, that's the values, that's the mission, that's the purpose. So if you don't have a purpose statement, then you've got all these different many cultures, the subcultures all yeah. going in completely different directions. Right. If you have one more star, then everybody is um, together in what their pursuit is. But my biggest uh, finding or my, my biggest belief is that fish rot from the head. So you can have one of the best cultures on the planet um, and everybody loves working with each other. But if you have one toxic leader, everyone that works underneath them hates their job. So yeah. Yeah, Kyle, I, I was I was gonna I was gonna ask this before William did, and you kind of answered it, but I, you know, I'll maybe go deeper on it. When you're when you study these companies and you're seeing that the they have different cultures or a variation of what the initial culture potentially is in the different departments, is that based? I've always had this feeling that it's been built on the hiring manager itself. So if there's a hiring manager in, I don't know, we'll call it the engineering department, and they're doing all the hiring and they're doing it free will. They don't have gloves on or, you know, cuffs on or anything. And they're hiring their own people who are like them, people they like, people that have their potential, you know, 
in, in their mind, potential for them. Aren't they, in a sense, building their own culture from department to department to department? So that's kind of where I've always laid culture for companies like you're describing that have a variation of culture in all, all of these different departments. I've always looked at it as the hiring manager setting that culture, right or wrong. That's just kind of how I always felt about it. Yeah, I don't think you're wrong at all. Uh, I, I think that's right. There's a, a small evolution, I think, that's happening, though, with companies that are trying to be more equitable and inclusive right. Um, right, yeah. as part of their values or, or, or even part of their mission. So from the top down, it says, we don't want you to hire people that are exactly like you. We want you to right. go outside of your comfort zone of talent and look yeah. for diverse voices. When managers or middle managers are given that kind of directive, then I think that opens up the that idea of just mm -hmm. folks who are just hiring folks like themselves. But again, that has to come from their leadership as well. Um, and if that's not something that is thought of at the senior leadership level, then I think mm -hmm. what you said is exactly what's gonna take place is that you've got if they said, hiring straight white men. If, yeah, if the board yeah. has set forth and the C-suite has set forth values, vision, and purpose, even in that scenario, Ryan, where people are are hiring kind of their own to their own uh, culture, mm -hmm. they're still dealing, they should be still doing it within uh, those two. constructs. Right. Right. So I think this is one of the misnomers in our industry is that there isn't one culture. It's cultures plural. Uh, Cal said it. It's all these different types of cultures. You got a New York sales office, and you, you know you've got a yeah. New, New New Zealand sales office. Those they're still selling. They're still doing certain things within the process that are exactly the same. But to say that they behave in the same way is it's not true. No. So I can I can kind of see that. I think it's again that rot, rot uh, the fish rotting deal is a, it's really a great example of thinking about okay, listen if it's rot it's up here it's going to eventually be rotten everywhere. Yeah, it's just a question of time. So this great disconnect. Let's uh, how do we how do we shore this up? So now let's fix it. Let's yeah, a couple of my the world's problem. You've got thirty <laughs> seconds, Kyle. Go. We're gonna do poverty. <laughs> And uh, we're going to serve a hunger after that. Anyhow, well, what's your, because you're advising clients uh, on these things. So you are help, trying to help them fix things. So where do you, what's your, what's your go-to? So you explain, here are the disconnects. And it's like, okay, resolution, because you need resolution on these things. What's your, where do you start? Yeah. Uh, an authentic employer brand is, is uh, up there as, kind of a leading solution for a lot of this, telling folks exactly what type of culture, exactly what type of environment that they can expect, even if it do doesn't seem super attractive, that's okay. Right. People right. value or respect the transparency more so than the perfect work condition. So that's number one. Uh, number two is like, also just give your employees a choice. Uh, I don't know if y'all um, are familiar with the longest running study on happiness is the Harvard study of yeah. human development. Yeah. Um, they found that choice was the number one determining factor behind someone's happiness. And so if someone feels like they do better work at home, give them the option to do so. And if they feel like they do better work in the office, give them the option to do so. And um, just allowing adults to make their own decisions on where they're going to do their best work and how they're going to do their best work. Obviously, right. you you'll, you need to, as a business, to need to create some goals surrounding that. Um, but there are certain worlds where there's no no reason why we need to force someone into a car for two hours a day. It, it doesn't make that business any more money if they're in a car for two hours a day. Um right. It definitely makes the employee less likely to be happy when they're at work if they're forced to go into an office. So because it, mm -hmm. it's, it's both that. sides, it's it's the commute to is dread because of traffic, and the commute home is frustration because of traffic. Right. Traffic commute. You know what I'm saying? Like you hit them twice in one day, yeah. and, and then, it's usually that commute home that really irks oh, the hell dude, out of you. I mean, you, like you just you're done. Ended a, you could have ended a great day. Yeah. You could have had a really cool day, did a bunch of cool stuff, yeah. and all of a sudden you get in your car, and, and Austin has 
terrible traffic. Yeah, Austin's traffic. a specific. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a specific. It's really LA kind of ish traffic. Like it's it doesn't matter. Like mm-hmm. in Dallas, okay, seven to nine is a little bit tough. Okay, four to about six, a little bit tough. But other than that, it's pretty easy to get places in right. Dallas. Right. In Austin, you could be there at eleven on a Saturday night. And it's locked down. Yeah, yeah. It is insane. Like LA. You can just be out on the five and all of a sudden it's like, why is this a parking lot? I don't understand. But you, to your point, Kyle, you hit them twice. They're dreading that. Mm-hmm. I gotta go sit in that. Yeah. I gotta go sit in that traffic. And then at the end of the day, even a great day, you hit them with the frustration on the way home. Well, not to mention like getting ready to go to work. That's a Good whole, point. whole nother hour at least before you even get oh, yeah. in the car. So that's, Oh, yeah, two yeah. hours in the morning just to work um and you're not getting paid of course for any of that and then another hour to get home and so yeah, yeah so giving folks a choice some some yeah. people do uh prefer to be in office and i love that for them they should yeah. definitely mm-hmm. have that yeah, option sure. um and then the last little like, well, like if we were to solve all the world's problems is as we are reduce as many barriers as you possibly can between getting someone to apply to your jobs. Like there's no reason why we need them to jump through so many hoops. A lot of employers are so worried about not finding the perfect candidate, but the perfect candidate is going to choose you. If you're authentic about the environment and the, and the workspace that you're going to be providing for that. So didn't that's, waste that's their time. the perfect candidate, the one that has agreed to work with you, even through yeah. some of the unattractive language that you might share with them. That's the perfect candidate. So those are the three main things I would love for employers to start considering going forward. Dude, great advice. Absolutely great advice. Thank yeah. you so much, uh, Kyle. Carving out time, helping us, helping the audience. This has just been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. Very, very big fans of you guys.